You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Okay, we're going to get started with Town of Brantford Board of Finance special meeting dated July 20th, 2020. And first on the agenda is to hear a presentation from the Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter regarding their efforts to upgrade and expand the shelter. Welcome, Laura. Thank How are you? So before I begin, I'd like to just introduce Marilyn Vallette. She is the chair of our commission. She has been um, in my I am green, but you cannot hear me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. and others came forward to help with the fundraising efforts and they helped to make the shelter what it is today. Do you want me to move? No. Back then the vision that they came up with was actually very much ahead of its time. Um, developments such as cat adoption rooms and dog play yards were something that were unheard of nearly 20 years ago. Fast forward to today, and with the support and guidance of First Selectman Cosgrove, we have continued to thrive and develop programming and provide services that are once again ahead of the curve. In addition to our animal control services to keep both the public and the animals safe, we provide therapeutic services and help those with disabilities develop independent living skills for both children and adults from places like Vista, Pathways, Sarah, amongst many others. We also offer Reading to the Animals program, an animal camp, a senior facility animal visits, free rabies vaccination clinics, dog handling, behavior classes, volunteer orientations, and much more. And with a robust volunteer base, we continue to provide many unique programs to assist, educate, and protect the public. While 20 years ago the building was ahead of the time, it's now needing a complete renovation and expansion. 20 years ago, no one could have ever imagined the robust and active facility our, our town would have. The Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter takes in between 500 and 750 animals a year, and with school groups, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and other groups, in addition to all the volunteers we have and visitors, we have between 20 and 25,000 people through our facility each year. With so many people in the building, it becomes crowded very quickly. The 2,500 square feet we currently reside in has quite a few inadequacies, and some of these include a five by 10 lobby, which is where the public enters, and it's also where animal control officers bring in the hurt and sick animals, and the public is standing right there. It also serves as an adoption and meet and greet room, and animal control officers have their desks up front right where the lobby is, and they conduct investigations there as well. Another issue is the ventilation system, which is contiguous throughout the building. This means infections like ringworm that is contagious to both humans and animals can be spread to everyone everywhere. In turn, it costs a lot of money to treat and care for all the animals infected, as well as trying to keep staff, volunteers, and the public free of infection. There is also no way to currently social distance at our facility due to cramped quarters and the many animals that we care for. During normal operations before COVID-19, this would impede our ability to hold programs at our facility because we have no indoor space to conduct classes like our dog handling courses. These programs are conducted in the parking lot, which is really not the proper place to be doing them. 
there, there's also no place to walk dogs, so we walk them in the parking lot up to Route 1, which can also be an issue because cars are coming in and out from both the transfer station and into the animal shelter. During times of economic downturn, organizations like ours are called and depended upon by the public more than ever. Residents who have lost jobs rely upon our pet food pantry to feed their animals. We also write for medical funding grants to assist those who may need help providing their animals with medical care. And while people have lost jobs and may be feeling depressed, their animals provide them with the solace and therapy that no one else can. So giving them up because of financial insecurities would be absolutely devastating to them. But on the other hand, there are those who decide they can no longer care for their animals because of being financially insecure. And they too depend on our ability to take in those animals so they do not abandon them. We have already seen increasing rates of animal abandonment and the need for the public to give up their animals because of COVID-19. Animal abandonment itself is not only sad for the animals, but it also could create public health and safety risks by people avoiding hitting roaming animals with their vehicles and residents trying to potentially capture and secure these animals without knowing if they are diseased or aggressive. The Commission and Animal Shelter staff have been diligently working over a two-year period to develop a project that our community would be proud of. We have enlisted the help of many professionals, including architects, consultants, builders, veterinary medical doctors, and others to assist us with the development and design of the new building. We have taken many things into consideration, including the cost and impact to the community, and we have been fundraising to offset that financial responsibility. The expansion and renovation are necessary because of health, welfare, and other concerns, and with your support, this new facility will provide not only a safe space for volunteers, staff, and the many unwanted animals we care for, but it will also be a place of hope, inspiration, and education that will continue to lead and guide others in the future. I'd like to show you a short video, if that would be okay. Um, and I'd also like to say, during times of economic downturn, especially working in a pandemic, you get to really know the people who work with you. And I just wanna say that I'm really proud of my staff um, they've changed the roles in the community to assist those who need it by doing things like grocery shopping and delivering pet foods and taking on responsibilities that might not have otherwise been expected. And never once did they look and say, that's not my job, that's not something I do. And I also want to say that with all of the changes that we have made because of COVID-19 and taking on different responsibilities, the first selectman has not only been supportive, but he's been guiding us through the process and we're really appreciative and, support and, and grateful for his support. Okay, thank you, Laura. We'll watch the video and then if we have, I'm sure we'll have some questions. Sure. 17 years ago, local volunteers joined together to create the Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter. At the time, it was a unique idea, a municipal animal shelter devoted to both public safety and to pet adoptions with regional reach and support. The shelter, currently housed in a 2,600 square foot building, includes 19 full kennels, two overpopulated cat rooms, one small cat quarantine room, a critter room, a laundry grooming area, minimal storage, and a tiny lobby with tight administrative space. This overcrowding leads to safety concerns. The access is a single entrance where potentially rabid, sick, or neglected animals are admitted, animal cruelty cases are investigated, school groups greeted, visitors welcomed, volunteers trained, and pet adoptions accomplished. These activities need to be separated for the safety of the animals, the visiting public, and staff. When walking through the building, you can't help but notice animals, donations, and supplies are kept in every room. The kitchen is a cat room. The bathroom is where a potential adopter can socialize with a cat. The director's office is a dog room and storage space. And there is a rodent problem. All the animals in the shelter share the same ventilation system. If one cat gets sick, all the cats catch it. Infections like ringworm can contaminate all who come into the building, including bunnies, dogs, cats, and even humans. Pregnant cats and kittens are most susceptible since their immune systems are less resistant to disease. The poor ventilation ends up costing a lot of money in medical bills once the animals come in contact with a virus or other illness. There is not enough space for welcoming school groups, conducting pet clinics, training, or hosting volunteers. People are routinely turned away. Dogs are kept in overcrowded kennels. It's not uncommon to have two or three litters. 
two of the 19 kennels house supplies since there is not storage space. The sound absorption is insufficient, creating more stress for abandoned animals in a new place. There is no air conditioning, making summers unbearable for canines. Outside the building, there is an inadequate parking area with a driveway that poses significant safety concerns. People leaving the shelter must dodge large trucks leaving the transfer station. That driveway is also the only option for volunteers or prospective adopters to walk dogs. When they get to the end of the driveway, they are left with the shoulder of Route 1 as the walking area. A renovation is necessary. The plans will double the size of the building. Entrances for the public and staff will be separated. There will be space for veterinarians to treat the animals much more efficiently than transporting them to the vet. The upgraded ventilation system will help keep sicknesses contained, which will further reduce medical expense. There will be expanded maternity and newborn cat space. There will be enlarged quarantine areas. There will be a pet food pantry for those in need. There will be additional storage. Animal control investigations will be performed away from public view. The new space will also feature a safe, spacious lobby for the visiting public, which emphasizes pet adoptions. There will also be three pet visiting rooms. There will be expanded cat rooms, including a large outdoor play area on the front of the building. There will be new kennel facades that are less cage-like and more adoption-friendly. There will be improved acoustics, a new floor, and air conditioning. There will be a new community education and training room to host animal clinics, volunteer training, and school groups. With the addition of two acres of land, there will finally be a safe space for volunteers and adopters to walk the dogs. The Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter is fortunate to have tireless animal advocates on our side. Because of that support, we are lucky to be able to raise some private funds, but we need your assistance. We hope Branford and North Branford will support this special place that serves animals and the people who love them. Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter, saving lives, one animal at a time. Okay, well thank you, Laura. Uh, that's, we will um, entertain questions from the board now. In your letter, you had said the anticipated budget was between 2.5 and 2.9 million. Did you want to touch on that? I know you're not prepared for any details tonight. Yeah, so um, the architect is working with the town on finalizing the numbers um, between construction and excavation and other things that need to be done. That's where um, the ballpark figure is right now. And when do you expect to come back to us with any request or any additional information? Uh, hopefully soon. Um, you know, I don't know when you guys have availability for another meeting, but I'm sure the architect will have numbers for us within the next two weeks or so. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'd like to open up to the board for questions. Charlie? So I built a couple of buildings in my time. So I built a couple of buildings in my time, and when we visited the shelter, you know, some time ago, storage space was at a premium. Is yeah. there enough storage? Because you never have enough storage when you build a building. <laughs> yeah, actually, after you were there, we went back and did speak to the architect again, based upon some of the things that you had pointed out. And um, we did add additional storage. So um, in the storage area, um, which was highlighted. So um, Eric, would you mind pointing? If you go to the, yeah, that second one. There's um, a storage area in the back, rear, right where the pet food pantry is. All the way, go down, Eric. Yep, that's where the storage area is. So um, we're gonna be increasing that area and we're also adding storage to where the community room is as well so we can store things in there. Okay, is it gonna be more than 5,000 square feet total? It, it's gonna be a little more than double the size of the shelter. Okay, so, I thought you said it was 25, so I said five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So one other thing. Like you mentioned in the narrative, North Brantford will fund 30%. Uh, is that a hope or is that a pledge? 
So I think first we have to get the approvals and make sure that Brantford's on board and then um, Jim and Jamie are gonna begin conversations with North Brantford. They're aware of the potential of this project. They know something's coming down the pike. Uh, Jim or Jamie, Jim. do you have any comments on that? Yeah, ba basically the uh, we're, we're in the process of updating our agreement with North Brantford. Uh, we've agreed to a, a document. Uh, I believe their council has either acted on it or will be acting on it. And the percentage that, we're, that is being used is 30% of the cost of the shelter. And so, uh, you know, the debt service would be, you know, 30% of the cost of the shelter. Uh, you know, so whatever the town would be paying, you know, minus any uh, private donations, any private grants, uh, that, that amount, they, they would basically pay us 30%. You would see that come into the operating budget on an annual basis. So that, that would come in as a revenue, but effectively if that's coming in to offset uh, a roughly 30% of the debt service. Uh, you have a representative from North Brantford here. Is, is, that, is there any comment you'd like to make, Stephanie? I don't believe there hasn't been a town council meeting held that I've been invited to recently, I believe because of COVID. So okay. I don't have any updates in terms of their position on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to um, look to consider. I'm having a tough time with my glasses here. <laughs> to consider and, if appropriate, approve a request from the board of, from the finance director for the following budget transfer from bond payments interest $282,423 to interest payments general purpose $45,248, interest payments schools $56,385. Interest payment sewers, 180,790. So that is the um, part of the request. The second one is to transfer from principal payments and debt service, a million five hundred thousand, and transfer out into the library project fund for a million five hundred thousand. And then on the library side, just to reflect revenues and expenses. Transfer in of a million five hundred thousand, and uh, expenditure authorization of a million five hundred thousand for bond proceeds. Um, Jim has sent us a letter with regards to the uh, the nuances of this request, which essentially moves money to the Blackstone Library and then uh, deauthorizes some of the. Uh, authorized but unissued amounts in the library project due to savings he's acquired through other bond transactions. Jim, you want to touch on the details, please? Sure. We're going to kind of uh, touch on all these together and try to tie it all up. Um, basically, if you go back to when uh, the bond refunding, you may recall, I think it was in the winter time. Uh, this board and subsequently the RTM approved a, uh, a refunding resolution. And there was a lot of things going on in the market at the time, obviously related to the stimulus. Uh, there, the municipal market was uh, somewhat unstable until the Federal Reserve kicked in and started buying Treasury securities. So one of the things that uh, I said at the time is I'm not sure that the refunding is going to happen, uh, but if it does happen, we should also, to save on the issuance cost economies of scale, uh, also do a m new money borrowing. And because I did not know if that transaction was going to occur in the old year or the new year, uh, the Board of Finance and RTM approved my recommendation to increase the debt service budget by about 400000 And uh, so when the budget was adopted, we had a, a uh, <clears throat> debt service budget of about 9.4 million. So that was what we were thinking at the time. Uh, so where are we today? So essentially we uh, 
had a uh, sale in June. We closed in July, so the bonds are dated in July. Uh, we saved about 195000 in debt service costs for the Clean Water Fund. Uh, and if you had asked me as a finance director if I ever had thought that the town of Brantford or any community for that matter would be in a position to refund Clean Water Fund uh, bonds and notes, uh, and just for the record, that those were the uh, notes and bonds to finance a lot of our consent decree, a lot of the treatment plant, and, and some of the uh, pump station upgrades. Those are 2% are loans uh, from the state of Connecticut. Uh, they pay off like mortgages, so they're monthly payments, unlike all of our other debt, which is semi-annual payments. And that, that's important distinction, which I'll get into later. So we ended up looking at refunding that. Uh, as I said earlier, we ended up having $195,000 in savings. It also gave us an opportunity to restructure uh, those clean water fund notes. So the refunding bonds actually shortened the maturities. Uh, also, one of the things it did is because the bonds were dated uh, in July, there's only one semi-annual interest payment. Remember I said when we were doing the budget, we thought we might have two. Uh, instead of making 12 months of principal and interest payments on the clean water fund obligations, uh, we only made one month because we made July 1st payments. So you basically had 11 months worth of clean water fund obligations, which were budgeted, which you no longer needed. Okay, uh, you still had to make this the semi-annual interest payment on that, but uh, you had already covered that by the uh, budget adjustment before you made your recommendation to the RTM. So what I what I thought I'd do now is just kind of I, I passed out a worksheet that uh, looks like this. And I think it kind of captures kind of all the events uh, on one page and also gives you a little bit of window into where we might be uh, going forward, which I think is relevant uh, in the context of looking at uh, an animal shelter request or uh, possibly in the capital plan, there, there was uh, funds identified in a later year for the high school roof uh, but as uh, the first selectman and I uh, are wor working with the Board of Ed talking about that roof because there's an opportunity to put solar panels on it and some of those uh, programs through the Green Bank uh, may not be guaranteed going forward, you know, years out. So, you know, kind of looking at the context of, uh, of doing something there. But what I want to focus on is when you look in sort of the, the first of the four boxes, you could see what our existing payments were. Uh, and then in 2020, we, we, you know, last October, uh, fiscal 2020, we sold the 45 million. Uh, at that point, uh, interest rates were, were good then. Uh, we had talked, uh, myself and the board and the first selectman, at uh, basically uh, being aggressive in that market because the, because the rates were good. So we issued that debt. Then the, uh, the sale that we had, uh, that we closed on in July, really had two components. Uh, there was uh, some new money borrowings, uh, which included uh, you know, the middle school, East Industrial Road, some of the sewer projects you had approved, I believe it was last January. Uh, and then you could see the new clean water fund debt and the old clean water fund debt. And so you could kind of see the different structure there. When you look at the bottom of the two, this, you know, the 6750 and the 6196322, one, that's the 195,000 in savings over the life of the bonds. Uh, and there's also a present value savings there as well. Uh, we have a utility loan, which we did through part of the Honeywell project, which was a zero interest loan at, uh, for 500,000. So uh, those are the remaining payments there. And then, then we looked at it and we said, well, you know, we could probably catch our breath for a little bit. And what if in fiscal 23, so September of 2022, we start looking at you know, some of the unfinanced projects and potentially other projects to finance. So if you look at, at the new issues, you got the balance of the sewer and pumps, drainage, uh, just rough estimates of 2 million for the roof, uh, animal shelter, 2.2, we're, we're hoping it's, it's lower than that. And of course, 
you know, almost two millions in, in uh, unknowns. Uh, and the unknowns could take a variety of issues. Uh, capital need comes up, there's a land purchase that's advantageous, or there's an investment we want to make, maybe it's energy savings again, or other projects in which we might want to authorize uh, debt for. And then, uh, Charlie, you touched on the, uh, on the North Brantford piece, about the 30%. So I threw in there a, a North Brantford revenue offset. Now, we're going to budget debt net. Uh, this would come in on the revenue side, uh, and it would be tied to our debt payments. So the next question is, well, okay, well, how does that look in terms of our overall debt service? And if you look at the 7.6 million and the 9.5 for 2022, you know, it looks like it's a big jump, but part of that big jump is because we're having savings, and we're taking that savings, and that's a million five in library debt that we don't have to issue now. So we're taking some of that savings and we're using it to avoid the future debt we'd have to issue for the library. Uh, also good news on the library front, I, I've been notified that they uh, did get a historic preservation grant for $100,000. So that's another non-debt resource to the project. So, uh, so of the five million uh, seven forty-five, because you authorized another uh, half a million uh, back in March, the amount of debt that the town is going to issue for that project is two million three forty-five. Okay, so I think there's a there's a good story there. Uh, and then going forward, the, the question is, well, then how does that look in terms of our debt obligations and you could see that you know going forward you know the the, the next year the debt will go up to 9593 uh, you go down to the page under other considerations if you look at that compared to the debt service budget that you adopted we're looking at about a hundred sixty thousand dollar increase or about 1.7 percent so all in all uh, you know your debt going forward is is relatively flat uh, where you had sort of the, uh, the trough is because of, of the refunding and the restructuring. Uh, but it, you're using that to offset any potential borrowing for the library. And so I think all in all, it, it, it worked out well with the restructuring. Uh, like I said, we saved money on a present value basis and a nominal basis. We did restructure our debt. Uh, we did pay down uh, debt for the library. Uh, and we shorten the clean water fund obligations. And if you look at our overall uh, debt burden, just doing a pro forma budget increase of 2.9% a year, uh, you can see that next year uh, we get close to 8%, uh, probably if you round it at 7.9. But what that, what that says is basically, you know, eight pennies of every dollar is being used uh, for the town's debt, for its borrowing as, as it relates to uh, funding capital projects. So what that second resolution does is, is basically, you know, wipes out the authorized unissued debt for the library because all of the revenue needs of the library will have been met now. The two million three forty five, the million dollar grant from the state, the hundred thousand uh, historic preservation grant, and the million five that, that you're using from the refunding savings. So uh, so I'll take a breath now and, and see if there's any questions, but that's, that's basically what, what we did, and it, you can kind of see it as, it as it plays out uh, on, uh, on this sheet. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as usual, in great uh, Finch fashion, a terrific uh, analysis and presentation. Uh, questions from the board on Jim's explanation and presentation on the debt financing? You're good. Um, Thanks, Jim. So the three for now, I'm going to take uh, item number two, which is has those three transfers. So why don't we um, entertain that? So that's moved, Robert, by, by Bob and seconded by Harry. Uh, questions, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then item number three is to consider a resolution repealing the James Blackstone Memorial library authorized and unissued bond authorization. So I will read that, um, which is, it's a resolution repealing the Blackstone Memorial Library authorized and unissued 
bond authorization having been replaced with other non-debt available funding. The Town of Brantford at representative meeting at a representative town meeting has approved the following project to be undertaken and financed by the issuance of bonds for which an authorized but unissued bond authorization remains. And it's, it, it outlines um, that in January 10th, 2018 and amended on April 22nd of 2020, there was a full authorization of 5745000 As Jim discussed, we've issued bonds in the total amount of 2345000 which would leave a authorized but unissued amount of 3400000 It is hereby found and determined that as a result of the issuance of the 5.4 million refunding bonds of the Town of Brantford, a budgetary savings in the debt service line item budget of approximately 1500000 will result in the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021, which upon transfer for the library project and together with $800,000 of donations and a $1,100,000 in state grant funding is sufficient to complete the library project without further debt incurred by the Town of Brantford. The appropriation shall remain unaffected and in place. Section 3 is now therefore it is authorized, I'm sorry, therefore it is hereby ordered that the library project having sufficient non-debt funding sources for its completion, the remaining authorized but unissued bonds, notes and other obligations of the town authorized be issued pursuant to the authorizing resolution is hereby repealed and withdrawn. So that's the proposed resolution. Questions on this? Victor. Um, what about the roof? Is, is there going to complete? Oh, sorry. The roof uh, on the, the the roof on the library is that resolved? The issues resolved with that? Jane, um, can yeah. you address that? So I I believe they have um, uh, the uh, downs. The construction manager has been finalizing the numbers, and I. Uh, they have enough within they do have enough within the project um, with, with adequate contingency to move forward they haven't completed the work they're at the stage uh, um, uh, you know looking at the numbers and final pricing but where they stood uh, in terms of a participated in a meeting um, July 4th week and uh, it seemed like they had enough in the project to move forward thank you okay Charlie you have a question yeah, Jim, is the 800000 donation, is that in the bank? Well, so, some of the pledges are over time, but uh, they, when uh, they, their thermometer, I, I believe, shows Yeah, I thought they raised that amount. Yeah, so. Okay, and the other thing is the 1.1 state uh, grant funding, is that in jeopardy at all? Well, no, there's, there's, two, there's two pieces. There's the, the million-dollar state library grant, which, you know, they had secured early on and we've received it uh the one that's that's recent and you know it's i, I found out about it probably within the last few weeks actually because uh, originally i was i was going to transfer a million six to the yeah. project and then with that other hundred thousand uh from the historic preservation and then it you know so that's a separate grant that's a different state agency okay you don't think it's in jeopardy though, though because of the uh, the problems well, going on. No, the one thing I can add is that the uh, the state historics uh, who awarded the grant has the money in place. So I did ask that question um, if this was uh, would then need to be approved or if it was part of a bonding package through the state, and they said no, the funds it's not in jet. From what the representative from the state said, that the funding is not in jeopardy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, it's been moved by Victor. I'll second it. Seconded by Jeff. I'll move the resolution. Okay, and it was seconded by Jeff. Additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Thanks, Jim, on that. Um, item number four is to receive a letter from the Director of Finance regarding a template to report monthly tax collection. Jim has attached a draft uh, that he and Harry uh, had worked on. Uh, so, Jim.
Jim, you would you like to go over that for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll just give a, a brief background and, and touch on the report. Uh, as this board is well aware, and, and members of the public probably need to be reminded, is that uh, you know when you were setting the mill rate, uh, all of us were were concerned about uh, the impact on tax collections. Uh, we thought it was reasonable to at least speculate that possibly, you know, five percent of the accounts could could be delinquent. Uh, you know, it's one out of one out of twenty basically. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, you know, uh, that un unrealistic. Uh, and, uh, you know, essentially uh, that sort of prompted a need to uh, closely monitor collections probably at a level that maybe we didn't do in the past because historically we've always uh, exceeded our budget when it came to tax collections. Uh, furthermore, uh, the, uh, you know, the governor's executive order gives people a longer time to pay uh, so we want to see how that impacts us. We discussed uh, cash flow, and uh, but the overall thought was, well, let's develop a template and let's bring it back to the board. Uh, and so uh, Harry graciously volunteered, and essentially uh, he and I met to kind of go over collections in general. Uh, we looked at the audit report, the tax collectors report that gets filed as part of the audit, and. Uh, Recognizing that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, I reached out to some other communities and got a couple sample reports and kind of picked some elements of uh, the ones that we liked. And uh, so essentially what you have is a report which gives you some fairly straightforward information. And, and the, this is just a sample report, so I, I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> these aren't real collections. So. Uh, and I think the areas you want to look at essentially are motor vehicles, personal property, real estate, and the supplemental motor vehicle. I know there were some uh, questions about supplemental motor vehicle uh, before the meeting. Uh, and then what are we collecting uh, through the month end? So each month we would have the cumulative total. And you also have to look at the, uh, the adjusted levy because I think most of you are aware that throughout the year, uh, folks appeal their assessment. Uh, there's lawful corrections. There's different things that are happening to, to the levy. It's, it's kind of a fluid uh, number. And so you really want to look at what are you collecting versus what is collectible. Okay. So that's why that second part of the worksheet is there. And then the other is, you know, how many accounts do we have and how many of them are delinquent. So it kind of gives you an idea, you know, what, what percentage are delinquent. Now, it may not be the perception of collections, because you could have, I mean, if Walmart was delinquent, it's one account, but it's a large tax bill. But at least it kind of gives you an idea uh, as to uh, kind of what your batting average is. And so we thought that this would be a, uh, a good format to communicate uh, to the board on a monthly basis. Uh, how things are looking in terms of uh, in terms of collections. Uh, Harry and I had a brief exchange. Uh, I don't know, it was about a week ago or so. Maybe. Uh, and and again, it's it's still like early in the month, but you know, right now we were actually this was like through the first week of July. We were we were ahead of where we were last year, but uh, I didn't want to read too much into that because one of the things we we've done differently this year is we implemented a lockbox program. So uh, you may have noticed on your uh, tax bill that if you mail it in, uh, your bill is going to go to Boston, which is, is where Bank of America uh, does their lockbox processing. And so, uh, so, so far we've gotten about, as of that time, we had about 2,600 uh, folks pay by lockbox. Uh, yeah, there were some exceptions, uh, probably, so probably about 87 percent of them went through without exceptions. Uh, it's our first year doing lockbox in a long time, so we're working through some of the uh, uh, the, the challenges. We, I was on a conference call before this meeting, along with uh, the tax office on that, and so you know there's some things that we're putting in place with the bank to kind of uh, improve that, but. 
you know, last year th those payments would have been mailed and would have come into the tax office and would have had to be handled manually. So, uh, so in that regard, you know, uh, it's a good thing the money gets into the account faster. Uh, so that so that's a good thing, and uh, so again, this was the uh, format we thought was uh, fairly straightforward. You know, it says what the levy is, what we collected, what the adjusted levy is, and what our actual uh, percentage is. And again, it, as I said earlier, it shows you the uh, the delinquent accounts. So, Jim, the only comment I'd have, I think it's this is a very good uh, start. Um, I think with the quantities, you know, I think it'd be good to have the quantities by type. Um, okay. And then the percentage of delinquencies by type, uh, knowing that, I don't know what the numbers are now, but you probably have about 1,500 personal property accounts or less than 2,000 personal property accounts, probably 12,000 or so real estate, and the rest is motor vehicle. Something in that general range, I'm sure that's not the right number, but yeah. that make up that 42,000 and the real estate as we know is secured by some type of lien potential uh, whereas the personal property and the motor vehicle if we don't collect it if they conceivably become bad debt. part of the suspense which will be yeah right so uh, but i think it's a it's a good concept so thanks harry for working on that with jim i uh after reviewing it you know i i, I think over the next six months because we know first of all on, on the automobiles it's a one-time payment so we'll we'll know what we have, what we, we don't have rather quickly. The question is gonna become in in reading up on financial matters other than than towns and cities, but more in terms of banking, is um, there's a growing delinquency in home mortgages. Now some of that is by the extensions that have been given by the government, but I think we could be faced with more delinquencies on the second payment. You know, and we're not going to know until it, it starts hitting. But I don't know if it would be prudent, Mr. Chairman, if, if we had a um, discussion uh, with the tax collector over the total collections on delinquencies, uh, you know, what the plan is, how it's going to be approached, because if, if we're sitting here in December, January, with some significant delinquencies, you know, what are we going to do? And uh, I know I was talking to Bob, and he had a few questions on that. So I don't know if you want to you want to chime in. Or... No, I I think you're right on target. Uh, of course, any uh, any escrows held by banks will be able to collect those. Yeah. They'll come in. It's it's the folks that are not escrowing that we have to be concerned about, uh, and you know, and keeping track of that, staying on top of that, uh, you know, early on is the key. So we'll know what uh, deficiencies we might have. So. Yeah, thank you. I think that's uh, that's a very good suggestion. What we'll do is we'll invite the tax collector to the uh, our next meeting. Yeah, August. I, I think it's uh, prudent. I was reading the uh, the journal this morning, and I know you're the bank, you're our banking experts, but it's. Uh, I know they're, they get the early warning signals and they're concerned about the, you know, the next uh, several months with regards to the economy mm -hmm. and the ability for people to be uh, paying some of their bills on a current basis. So uh, mm -hmm. knowing that the, what do we have, about 30 to 40 percent that's paid by escrow and so that's one indicator. The other is that the rest of the real estate is paid privately not through, without the uh, mortgage es escrow process. So. There's a lot at risk, and hopefully uh, things will improve as time goes on. Yeah, and I don't know on the tax rules, Jim, if we can do, do you separate these between primary investment and second homes. That that I'm not sure of. Uh, you know, I'm not as familiar with the, with the with the tax system. I guess one potential way of looking at it would be if there's a uh, you know out of state address for for a Brantford home. Uh, I, I do think that you know uh, you know maybe that's something we look at going going forward. But I think what I'm hearing tonight, uh, some of the uh, more 
more critical things would probably be looking at, you know, I would say where we are at the end of October because that's where folks have the grace period. Uh, and then looking at it, at it, at the numbers by type, I think to Joe's suggestion, uh, you know, is, is, is a good thing. And, uh, and you'll see where, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're going to probably see more on the motor vehicles, to Joe's point. I mean, motor vehicles typically have a lower collection rate. Uh, one of the things that, you know, if there's any silver lining in it, and, and this is, uh, you know, with the revaluation, uh, real estate becomes a larger portion of your overall grant list. Uh, and real estate traditionally has a higher collection rate. So uh, in normal times, that, that would be a good thing. Uh, but again, uh, what I said uh, when we talked about the last time, it's, you know, there's risk and there's uncertainty, right? And so this has uh, a little bit of uncertainty to it. Like I said, it's not like rolling the dice or flipping a coin. It's, uh, you know, these are things that we're not necessarily uh, accustomed to. Uh, it's something that uh, bond rating agencies are looking at. Uh, one of the things that helped us is our fund balance, which means we have a strong cash position, and it means we have liquidity. Uh, communities that are less well-reserved uh, and less cash and large obligations are the ones that uh, are, under, are under greater pressure. And some of them, you know, nationally that might be relying, imagine if the town of Brantford was relying on sales tax revenue. So uh, so we do have some good things going <clears throat> for us, but I think that uh, to everybody that I think is in agreement that, uh, you know, it's, it's different times and, and these reports are gonna give us a window into what's happening out there. So Chairman, a question, you, you sure, Harry. reminded me of, of uh, a question from the man on the street or the, or the green. I usually have breakfast out there in the green on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings with a couple of friends, but uh, uh, people will converse. One, one of the things they, they're having an issue with is, is they don't understand what the lockbox is. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I would think, through the first selectman, it, it would be good to get some news release out over it's the money coming directly to the bank. It's not going to some agency. They don't understand a lockbox and the purpose. Gotcha. So um, uh, uh, I Thanks, think it would be a, a good communique. Yeah. Like I had mentioned to, to Jim when he had mentioned that they were uh, reinstituting the lockboxes, that we actually put that in place in the 1980s, you know, and utilized it because of, uh, again, there was a different technology there and the processes, you know, improved. And back then, the sooner you got the money in the bank, there was real interest being paid. Yeah. And so that was a, an institute, I think, that Janet uh, Kaminsky yeah. had put in place back when she was a tax collector. It very, you know, it's it's it does cost something, but it, that back then there was a cost benefit to it. In this case, it actually had some controls, which are a good improvement um, to the to the collection process. And if people think about it, it's when you send whatever bill you pay. It may be a credit card bill. It may be some other processing like bill. Like a utility bill. A, a utility bills. Bill. They're all going to a lock, tech quote unquote lock box, which is basically a processing center that's run by the banks or in a banking system, which then moves the money and sends data files in order to update our records. So uh, it's something new, but it's it's really just a reinstitution well, of something we've had. It's positive. It is positive. It's a, it's a good move and it, it's, good. it's good for the town. It's good for the tax office. Uh, but so uh, maybe good for. Would like to quote you on that? In the, in the uh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. But I, I'll, I'll leave it to Jamie to promote it in any other fashion. Now, again, I, I believe some messaging did go out, uh, but I will uh, follow up with the tax collector as well, and uh, we'll put out a community message. Just uh, whenever there's a change. Uh, I'm sure some residents have some questions of where this is going, why it's going yeah. there. So yeah, I mean, they can call tax collector. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. instead of we're getting multiple deposits a day, like a different, me? we're getting multiple deposits throughout the day. Oh, well, it's wonderful. Yeah, with, I mean, with the yeah. lockbox. We talked about that. We talked about that last week. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, is where uh, when we went away from the lockbox was, and Joe was right, when the technology changed, and they had the uh, the bar scanning on the tax bills. 
and then when QDS had that upgrade, they could scan it. So the time it took somebody to process an actual payment, you know, was reduced uh, dramatically. And uh, and a prior tax collector, uh, basically, when that technology was put in place, uh, organized her staff in the mail around the around that, so that it was able to get that stuff uh, processed quickly. Uh, but presently, we think the technology has changed and it's gotten better, and so. Uh, we're getting back into that game now. So, so. All right. Thanks, Harry, for that. And You're welcome, Jim. Thanks for the presentation. Yep. And Jamie, appreciate that. And with no other business to come before the board, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.